Macy. We can yes, hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning. We are now going to switch around the agenda a little bit and start with the Operational Planning and Infrastructure Committee meeting. Teresa, once you make your way back to your seat, will you mind doing roll call? Sorry about that. All right, Ms. Welch? Here. Ms. L Mr. Love? Here. And Mr. Sleesman? Here. You have three committee members present. You have a quorum. Thank you. We do have two presentations on the agenda today. One is a licensing agreement, and the other is going to be an IFB procurement. First up, we're going to have the licensing agreement with a presentation for that agreement with Neograph Solutions LLC for access and laydown area to support the West 117th Bridge Rehabilitation Project. Up at the podium, we have Jim Reed, Property Manager and Programming and Planning for GCRTA. Thank you so much. You just got to hit the mic. There we go. Thank you, Ms. Welch. Uh, today I would like to present for your consideration uh, a license agreement uh, for access and laydown areas <clears throat> excuse me, to support the West 117th Street Bridge Rehabilitation Project. Oops, wrong way. A little bit of background, the West 117th Bridge Rehabilitation Project is a multi-year project Unfortunately, there is no convenient access to the construction site, which is, in essence, above West 117th Street. And laydown areas are also required for the materials and equipment. <clears throat> Fortunately, the Neograph property is adjacent to the site, and they have been cooperative in allowing access from Madison Avenue to the, to the site. This is a location map of the property um, with the project site highlighted in red. As you can see, the uh, West 117th and Madison Rapid Station is directly to the northeast, and the Neograph property is across West 117th Street. The access, uh, this doesn't really um, reproduce very well on the screen, so you should have a handout in your packet that would uh, highlight this. We'll, we'll enter, uh, RTA and its contractors will enter from Madison Avenue and take that somewhat circuitous route. Uh, the reason for that is it, it avoids all of the uh, uh, daily uh, operations of, of Neograph and keeps us a little bit out of their way. It leads us down to the lower uh, left of the Neograph property where we have a laydown area and then a second laydown area a little closer to the site. The agreement will start May 18th, 2024, and end December 31st, 2025. Uh, RTA may terminate early if the project is completed before December 31st. The license fees will be $3,000 per month, with a not to exceed cost of $58,400 for the full term. The staff recommends approval of the agreement with Neograph Solutions LLC for a term beginning May 18th, 2024, and ending December 31, 2025, with a cost of $58,400. Thank Question. you so much. Thanks. Questions from the committee? 
Questions from the board as a whole? Do I have a motion to move forward with this license agreement? Motion. Second. Any yays? Any nays? Any nays? Excuse me, sorry. Yay. Any opposed? All right, we are going to move forward with the licensing agreement. Thank you so much. Next up, we have the IFB procurement, a presentation of a competitive procurement for the Port of Cleveland connection to the waterfront line, which will allow for delivery of the new rail car fleet. Up at the podium, we have Jonathan Lawley, Program Contract Manager for Procurement, and Kathleen McGurvey, Engineering Project Manager for Track Engineering and Project Development. You may now have the floor. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Welch, members of the committee, members of the board. Um, Kathleen McGurvey uh, here from Engineering and Jonathan Lawley from Procurement presenting the Port Connector Track. Uh, okay, so the Port tr Connector Track will connect the uh, Waterfront Line Track, RTA's track, to the port. And uh, you can see the location um, in this uh, diagram, the general location over there near the tracks there uh, at the port property. The new Siemens cars will be uh, shipped to RTA via rail, and we don't have any way to unload them um, on our property. So the purpose of this project is to provide that unloading uh, facility. And um, the port uh, will provide a safe unloading area, and it's close to RTA, as you could see from that previous photo. Here's a picture showing the general alignment of the track. Uh, it's not. That's a single line, obviously, showing uh, where for the double line. And here's a more detailed look at the uh, connection. And uh, the hatched area is a temporary easement that RTA has negotiated with the port for construction purposes. And the project includes a, one turnout on the port property and one turnout on the waterfront line. Uh, in addition, of course, there's the connecting track, and then we have a drainage pipe and some fencing. And now Jonathan will present the procurement. The invitation for bid for this project was issued on January 15th of 2024. 16 uh, contractors reviewed the package for submitted a bid for this project. The lowest responsive responsible bidder for this project was Kennedy Railroad Services, LLC. They will be using Cook Paving and Construction Incorporated to meet the 5% DBE participation goal assigned to this project. Kennedy Railroad Services LLC has completed projects for Cargill, Lubrizol, M&M Industries, Aleron Nuclear Services, among other organizations. For this project, the staff requests that this committee recommend award to Kennedy Railroad Services LLC for this project in a contract amount not to exceed $883,443. Any questions? Any questions from the committee? Any questions from the board as a whole? Uh, I do. Yes, Mayor Wise. I may. Yes. Um, can someone just give me a little bit of background on um, just the basics of how many, I mean, I know we're, it's premature because we just put orders in and we're talking about already taking um, acceptance of, of the cars, but how many are coming in at a time, um, or does it change as the as the project continues along? I'm just trying to understand kind of how often these improvements are being used. I'm going to actually call on Dr. Caver to answer that for the rail car team. Good morning, Chairman Welch, uh, Mayor Weiss, and members of the board. I'm Flonse Caver, the Chief Operating Officer. So we expect that our trains will start to come in and uh, this uh, summer, June of 20, uh, June of 2026, um, they will ramp up. So the first will come um, about one a month, uh, and then we might end up with having two. At no point will we have more than 12 cars on the property that will be here. And so we'll be using this port connector to accept every car that comes in. It will be shipped by rail. So if you can picture the Brown Stadium, the big rail line will ship it. It comes across our tracks into the port, and once it's in the port, by the port rules, it has to be unloaded by the longshoremen there. 
placed onto a track that will then slip back into our track so we can so that we can uh, tow that train to Brook Park so it can be accepted. But we will be accepting trains for approximately from the time that we start for approximately seven years. Thank you, very helpful. Any additional questions? Just a quick, uh, Mike, if you wanted to kind of shout out the port on their, um, their collaboration with us on this project, I think it, it's of note. Yeah, I mean, the port has been a, a very good partner working with our team. Obviously, they're gonna get some revenue um, from uh, receiving the trains, but they've been a really good partner for us. This is a section of the port that's not well utilized. Uh, they already have a spur track that comes off the main line, so it made a lot of sense for us to be able to make that connection to the waterfront line. Um, you know, it's you know, it's only you know 400 feet, but it's a pretty important connection, and uh, um, so they've been very good partners with us and working with our team, and uh, so we're very happy to have this. One of the reasons we're doing this now is that those turnouts have a 45 week lead time. So, you know, you think about that, that's, that's about a nine month lead time. We'll, we'll actually build this, you know, in, in 2025, but we need to get the, uh, the order in and the long lead items ordered so that they can be built and we have this ready to accept the first train. And, and if I could add, uh, Ms. Terry, so it also becomes an asset to the authority because we will be able to, uh, for the foreseeable future, but for the length of time that we have it, we'll be able to now accept more items via rail than we would have before. So if we have other major parts, they can always ship uh, via, via the waterfront and we can accept them at the port. Yes. Trustee Love. Thank you. Thank you for the overview. Just for clarification, so, so in the long term, this will be, is this a GCRTA asset or is it a, a, a port asset? RTA will own the track and then we're going to have an easement with the port that's going to be coming before the board um, in the near future for a permanent easement. Thank you. So right now there's a temporary, but you envision a permanent easement? That's correct, just for maintenance and, of course, you know, use of the track. And Doc, just one question out of curiosity. Do these new rail cars get lifted off uh, the rail cars that they're coming in from, from Sacramento, like with a crane? Yes. Okay. They'll be lifted off and placed onto the track. And once they get placed on the track, there will be a train or machine that will tow them. Uh, so that we can couple into them with a train that we've purchased that will then drag them and tow them to Brook Park. Do I have a motion to move forward with the, with the IFB procurement? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any more people want to say aye? Any, any opposed? Okay. All right. Well, we're going to move forward with the IFB procurement. Do I have a motion to adjourn the Operating Planning and Infrastructure Committee? Motion. Second. We will now adjourn the Operational Planning and Infrastructure Committee. Good morning. I'm gonna to call to order at 914, the Organizational Services and Performance Monitoring Committee. Roll call, please. Mayor Biasiata. Here. Ms. Welch. Here. Ms. Pachetti. Here. Mr. Sleesman. Here. And Mayor Weiss. Here. You have five committee members present. You have a quorum. Thank you. We have two items on our agenda today. Uh, the first is a procurement um, to replace the chairs in our rail cars, the seats, I should say. And the second is for the washing and cleaning of our rapid stations. So first up, we're going to have the procurement for the presentation of the competitive procurement to replace the Doherty's cloth rail car seats with vinyl. Our presenters today are Jeff Grubb, Assistant Equipment Manager, and Anne-Marie Prebish, Contract Administrator. Mr. Grubb, the floor is yours. 
All right, good morning, Chairperson, Chairperson Biasiata, uh, committee members and members of the board. Uh, my name is Jeff Grubb. I'm the acting equipment manager of the rail district. Uh, I will be presenting with Anne-Marie Prebish, uh, contract administrator on the rail car vinyl seat project. I'd like to hand out some uh, vinyl we brought with you guys so you guys can see the vinyl we'll be talking about while I do the presentation. When you're looking at the vinyl, the, um, there's a textured vinyl on top. That's going to be the top of the seat and the back of the seats. The uh, smoother texture is going to be the sides of the seats. that's going to wrap around the bottom of the seat. All right. This project came to light from our customer uh, experience satisfaction surveys from our traction program. Uh, the first wave, if you see up on the, the screen there, the first wave does not show, uh, or there's no first wave shown because it was just uh, identified as cleaning needed to be done. We didn't identify the subdivisions at that point. Um, but you can see seats, floors, and odors were t uh, the top three. This led to uh, improved cleaning processes and introduction of eye mops to help clean the floors and uh, even a, 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 a remote clean team at Windermere for the heavy rail. 2023, the seats, floors, and odors still remain the top three. Um, the numbers did come down, but uh, they got better. So um, the public is still asking for cleaner seats. The best way for us to get cleaner seats at this point is to replace the seats. Um, these seats that we currently have are the, the cloth seats. Um, in our, our TD out of Denver uses the same similar customer uh, experience satisfaction survey. And they identified seats as being an issue for them too, and they are in the process right now of converting all of their cloth seats over to um, vinyl. And I want to say they have a 200 car fleet that they're completing that on. And locally, Dart out of Dayton, Ohio, converted their buses to vinyl recently, and uh, they have plans starting to convert their light rail vehicles to these vinyl seats in the spring of this year. Uh, the seats you're, uh, the vinyl you're looking at uh, is modeled after New Jersey Transit, so they have very similar seats. It's kind of same same exact fabrics, but we went with a little bit different of a uh, uh, design. Um, our current seats were last replaced um, in the LRV fleet in 2005. That's our light rail and our heavy rail fleet in 2013. Uh, since then, the seats have been cleaned and maintained and replaced as needed, but there has been no. Uh, project to replace the seats as a whole since then. Uh, this is a picture from car 806. It's our, uh, one of our light rail vehicles. We purchased some seats and tested them in this car and another one. Uh, I think it was 193, which is a heavy rail. Um, we got a lot of good feedback from operators. Uh, I even, on uh, St. Patty's Day, I rode the system monitoring the system and um, had passengers asking me when we were going to be putting the vinyl in the rest of the uh, fleet, not if we were going to be. Uh, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the seats. You can see newer fabric seats on the left, um, the vinyl seats in the center, and then faded fabric seats on the right. So uh, you can see that the seats just look more inviting to sit in. Uh, cloth seats, they've, we've been with them now for quite some time. They, they soak up uh, spills rapidly. Um, they're very easily stained. The fabric retain odors, which odor was the number three complaint from the customers of the cleanliness of our trains. And they fade over time, especially with wear and tear, and, our, and especially with um, COVID, the use of uh, term, or uh, I forget the name of the stuff, Terminator. It was, it rapidly increased the speed that these seats started fading and wearing, so it, it kind of, um, wore them out too fast for us. It made them wear out uh, quicker than we expected. The current cleaning process with the, the, the fabric seats, we use this uh, large machine called an extractor, which is just a fancy name for an industrial carpet cleaner. Um, we employ an employee that takes, he, he uses the machine, it takes about four hours to clean one rail car. Um, it's a pretty heavy machine. It's about three feet tall when it's fully loaded with soap it's, and water. It's over 100 pounds. Um, and it's got a 15-foot hose you got to lug around in and out of the train. We have to schedule a train to come into the shop to be able to be cleaned. And it takes several weeks for us to cycle through all of these cars to, uh, for the cleaning uh, uh, program we have. Um, here, if you look closely, you'll see like a brown t uh, hue to the seats at this point. This is after extraction, so it pulls some of the dirt to the surface, so we have to follow up with the uh, extraction with a vacuum and clean up the seats with a vacuum afterwards. 
by going to vinyl, our cleaning process would be a simple spray bottle and a rag, and we no longer would have to call the cars in for a spill. We can, we can spot clean it while in service. We don't have to down the train, nothing. It's, it's uh, immediate clean whenever needed. So savings right now, what we're looking at is improved cleaning efficiency. Uh, cars can be cleaned in service, no longer need to call them in. Uh, majority of the fleet can be cleaned daily rather than waiting for the uh, you know, several week lead time for us to call them all in. Seat, repla re uh, sorry, seat replacements uh, will only need to be done to damage seats. Right now we uh, replace roughly five seat bottoms per week, which doesn't seem like much, but it's three and a half cars worth of seats are thrown away each year just because they're too dirty to be cleaned. Um, we'll save money on our equipment. We no longer have to employ that large machine, maintain that large machine, or replace that large machine. It's just a spray bottle at this point with a rag. And uh, another point of cost savings is the uh, lowest bid that came that we received for this is actually 50% cheaper than the cost of buying our fabric seats at this time. And uh, here's Anne Marie with the IFB portion. Good morning, my name is Anne Marie Prebish and I am the contract administrator for this procurement. The invitation for bid or IFB was issued January 21st, 2024. It was accessed on our website by 33 interested parties. Six firms submitted bids and five bids were determined to be responsive. And just to quickly touch on the procurement process for an IFB, the basis of award is the lowest responsive bid from a responsible bidder. With that being said, the lowest responsive and responsible vendor was Friedman Seating Company, and there was a 0% DBE participation goal assigned to this project. Friedman's client base includes Chicago Transit Authority, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, Sound Transit Seattle, Phoenix Valley Metro, Twin Cities Metro, among others. And Staff requests that this committee award to Friedman Seating Company for the rail vinyl seat upholstery. The contract is in an amount not to exceed $298,490.72. And Jeff and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Anyone? Hi. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I really appreciate, first of all, that you are being responsive to a customer survey. So <laughs> that's, um, it's great to see, and it's exciting. I'm looking forward to the new seats. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about the survey uh, itself. So if you don't mind, I just wanted clarity on, um, it was the customer satisfaction survey at the very beginning of your slide deck. Um, when, when we saw the big red bars, were those, what exactly was that? So it was like 70% of people were highly dissatisfied. What, what did that mean? I, I just wanted clarification. Does that make sense? I think there was the, this one, this one and then the next one. Yep, these two. Good morning, Chairman Welsh, um, board member, uh, Ms. Barsetti Pachetti. Um, so these, this particular ch uh, chart is talking about uh, what do customers feel are the most important items to, to perceive in a clean vehicle. And so um, we ask if they believe it's clean, that number is about in the 50s percent, uh, 50, 60 percent of the people believe the train is clean. So then we ask, you know, so what areas are the areas that we should focus on? And this is that the largest group in each wave is saying, if the seats were clean, this thing would feel a lot cleaner. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Thank you. I'd echo Trustee Pachetti's um, commendation for responding to the customer surveys. So this is just replacing the cushions. The seat frame will stay. Correct. And could you elaborate a little bit on the time to, to roll in this improvement and how that goes with the rail car, the actual rail car replacement, which I know is over a much longer time period? How long is it going to take us to change it? Six months from the notice. The contract is going to be six months after notice to proceed to complete the coverage of all these cars. Seats. 
yet will be on the both the heavy rail, heavy rail and light rail. Um, some of these cars, as you know, we're replacing the HRV first. Um, the heavy rail cars first um, with the new rail cars, but some of the light rail cars will be in service up until we replace them up to the seven years of the contract. So it's time to get the seats replaced. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think some buses also have fabric seats. Is there any plan to do buses following the rail cars? Um. So in 2014, we, or maybe 2016, we changed all of the newer buses to having the plastic seats. Mm -hmm. um, there may be still the carpeted seats in some of our specialty fleets. I don't have a fleet director, but I think in our 40 foot buses, the majority of them, if not all of them should be out. The last remaining bus that had them when they were purchased, um, the last remaining large fleet were the vehicle is called a Navi, but the gray bus that you see out, but the white buses should have, and I'll check while we're talking, it should have all plastic seats in them, or it should be almost there. But the, say the park and ride buses, we will not change them out. They're cloth seats. It provides a different ride and a different customer base. Thank you. My final question is, is about kind of the molded plastic seats that we see on the bus. Did we look at yes. putting those in the rail cars instead of a cushioned vinyl? And what's kind of the calculation there? Yeah, so we did. Uh, the molded plastic seats will be in our new trains. Uh, but in order to do so, we would have had to change the whole seating apparatus, whereas this is just an upholstery overlay. And so the cushion will be the same. Instead of uh, overlaying it with a carpeted seat, we'll be overlaying it with uh, a replacement, which will be a vinyl seat. But in order to do so, we would have had to change the bench structure, and we didn't want to make that investment in a train that's going away. Thank you. I really appreciate the effort to kind of make a fix now in an economical way as we wait on the new rail cars to come. You're welcome. Yep. Any further questions from the board? Comments? Wonderful. I'm going to move to approve this procurement. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Second. Who gave the second? I couldn't hear. Okay. Thanks. I think it's... Um, a wonderful thing. Thank you to my fellow committee members for advancing this. We're now going to move on to a procurement presentation for Rapid Station Washing and Cleaning Services. Uh, this contract will be for a period of three years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rosenblum, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Chairman Biasiata, committee members, and members of the board. My name is Jason Rosenlieb. I'm the manager of rail facilities and janitorial. I, along with Anne Marie Previsch from Procurement, contract administrator, will presented will be presenting on rapid station facilities, power washing, and cleaning. The scope of services: it is a three-year contract term. It is window cleaning exterior, window cleaning interior, stainless steel cleaning, window sill cleaning structure framework cleaning, fiberglass partition cleaning, elevator interior, exterior tracks and shafts, and covered walkways. Washing and cleaning services are performed twice annually at these 25 locations. Of these 25 to note are West 25th, Puritus, West 3rd, the Rocket Mortgage Walkway, and North Coast, North Coast East 9th. Some examples. That is West 25th. West 25th, as you can see, is large. Um, to note is all the framework. From the track to the top of the bell tower, as they call it, it is 72 feet. Um, from the West 25th side to the top, it's about 45 feet. Um, on the picture on the right, that is actually a cleaning company already um, on the track getting ready to clean the inside. Um, this would be North Coast uh, East 9th, again, a massive uh, station, a lot of framework and windows. Picture on the right is gentlemen rigged up, getting ready to drop down to clean the windows. Another example, Puritus is on the left, West 117th on the right, a lot of windows at a, um, a tall height. And then on the left-hand side, at West 3rd, which is the Brown Stadium, framework and windows. And then on the right uh, is the Rocket Mortgage Walkway. I'll turn it over to Anne Marie in the procurement side. Thank you. Sure. Good morning again. My name is Anne Marie Prevish, and I'm the contract administrator for this procurement. 
The invitation for bidder IFB was issued February 11th, 2024. It was accessed on our website by 35 interested parties. Two firms submitted bids. The lowest responsive and responsible bidder was Premier Window Cleaning LLC. There was a 17% DBE participation goal assigned to this project. Premier Window Cleaning LLC will meet this goal by utilizing Brush Striping LLC. Some of Premier's client base includes the Cleveland Clinic, American Greetings, Nestle, The Ohio State University, Cleveland State University, and GCRTA, among others. Our recommendation, staff requests that this committee recommend award to Premier Window Cleaning LLC for the rapid station washing and cleaning. The contract is in an amount not to exceed $161,040 per year for a total contract amount not to exceed $483,120 for the three-year period. And Jason and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, thank you. Any questions from the committee? Ms. Pichetti. Hi, good morning, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to understand if this represents um, like just maintaining the status quo of what we already have in terms of cleaning services or is there, are there some improvements being made in, in this, um, in what we're asked, in what we are asking um, the contractor to do? This would be status quo. And follow up? Do you have any other, Mayor? Um, just um, a question on the 25, these are, these are all, all the stations? No, it's not it's, all, well, it's all of our large structures. Well, that's what I was kind yeah, of getting Yeah, along the blue and green line, I mean, it's mostly whistle stops. There's no structure there, so. Right, so these are just the physical Correct. stations? Correct. Okay, but that's, that's, that's the universe of the large physical stations? Correct. Okay, thank you. Just a, a question in, in the same vein. I saw this was done on a semi-annual basis, and we, we had some discussion at our last meeting um, on surveys and sort of cleanliness overall. Between these major cleanings, um, w what is performed like in terms of the frequency of, of cleaning that might be done by RTA teams or other subcontractors? Okay, so currently we have a um, power washing team that does interiors that are on about every 45 day period to do all of almost about every, um, all those stations, but we also do some on the blue and green line. So we are doing the interiors on the low. This is mostly for higher ups, all the things that take specialized equipment that we just, we just don't have. Thank you. Any other questions? Real quick along the same lines. Um, so like we would do the more spot cleaning too if something comes up in between any of these? Of course, yes. Internally? Again, that was all in, um, that's encompassed on the 45-day team. Yeah. Um, we've increased what we're doing gotcha. because of the customer satisfaction surveys. Again, this is more of a specialized, right, right. specialized equipment. It involves um, shutdowns of the overhead so they can get up and work above the overhead. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we're always, um, always cleaning, as we say. Yeah, gotcha. Thanks. Ms. Terry? Uh, well, we're, we're basically well, cleaning 24-7. Um, three shifts nonstop. It's a never-ending task. Mayor Kumar? So you do the power washing, but obviously on a weekly basis, so if there's trash or something that's dropped, that's picked up again on even a lower level of, mm -hmm. of maintenance. Yeah. Ms. Mertz on Terry, floor is yours. Thank you. I um, just wanted to say um, I appreciate the questions of all of the detail. Um, just to recap, we handle the lower levels of those windows. So if you have spot cleaning or incidents that happen or just regular maintenance, we can handle that. But when you get up into the harnesses, I think it was the uh, photo reminiscent of the, the black and white when you see the guys with the lunchbox, right? If you remember that, that's what we're paying for, right? That's the liability that is included in those kind of um, uh, higher risk kind of elevation for uh, making sure that our windows are clean at the higher level. Um, and I just also wanna say thank you to the team. I think that this is really um, a response. Uh, Ms. Merson might have mentioned it as well as Ms. Pachetti. This is our response to the customer. Um, we've talked with Mayor Biasiata as well as others on the board that we have to make sure that we act now. And a lot of these surveys that we have are not always fantastic. So if we have a response from the, the public that says we need to get better 
at cleanliness, safety, lighting. We're going to make sure that we do those things in the immediate future as well as plan for further out. So uh, just to make sure that we reiterate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Ms. Mersman. This is more of a comment than a question. I, I think it's really interesting how your presentation highlights the diversity of stations that we have in terms of architecture and design. And I'm kind of curious if or how, and this can just be a comment. We don't have to <laughs> discuss it in detail this morning, but um, how lessons learned around maintenance and potentially also customer preference according to different station design feed into um, new stations or, or rehabs to stations. I mean, just thinking about the, the ones along the waterfront that are basically all glass and very tall, I can imagine that as a user that feels safer. There's more light and view permeability to that, but it's also a huge burden in terms of keeping all those windows clean. Um, so it just seems like there's a lot of potential pieces of knowledge to extract in terms of user and maintenance experience that could feed into future planning. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I move to approve this procurement for uh, washing and cleaning services. I have a second. Second, Welch. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The procurement's passed to the full committee. Um, any new business for organizational services and performance monitoring committee? Hearing none, I move to adjourn the meeting at 9.37. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor of adjournment, aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The meeting is adjourned. I'd like to call to order the RTA Audit Safety Compliance and Real Estate Committee. Teresa, if you could please call the roll. Mayor Kumar. Here. Ms. Welch. Here. Ms. Mersman. Here. Mr. Sleesman. Here. And Mayor Weiss. Here. You have five committee members present. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one item today, a lease, <coughs> lease agreement, um, a presentation of renewal lease with two words, shuttle and detail. And I think Jim Rusnoff is here to present. Welcome, Jim. Teresa, I may need a little help finding our uh, place Go here. A couple more. A couple more? Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Board President Kumar, members of the committee, and members of the board. I'm Jim Rusnoff, real estate manager. This morning, I'm pleased to present for your consideration a lease renewal for an existing tenant, Two Birds Shuttle in Detail LLC, an Ohio limited liability company based in Cleveland. It's also my pleasure to welcome and to introduce Mr. Anthony Russell, the owner of Two Birds Shuttle in Detail. Mr. Russell is joining us today. Both Mr. Russell and I would be available after my remarks to respond to your questions and comments. And unlike most of my presentations to this board, uh, today's remarks will be limited to just about six minutes. Mm -hmm. Teresa has me on a short lease today. <laughs> First, for the benefit of newer board members and to provide evidence to support this renewal request, I offer a brief history of our working relationship with Two Birds. In late 2018, Mr. Russell approached RTA with a concept to provide a new level and variety of customer service amenities at the Puritus West 150th Street Rail Station. Amenities included secure overnight parking, limited shuttle service to and from the airport, auto detailing services, and a small retail convenience center. I was initially impressed with both Mr. Russell's business plan and his thoughtful presentation and recommended to my colleagues that we consider this request. We determined the concept to have merit and to fit within the parameters of RTA's real estate program goals and objectives. 
concept also present a unique and welcome amenity package to our Puritus Rail Station customers on underutilized adjacent property. In February of 2020, the administration offered a short-term two-year lease with a possible extension to Mr. Russell, affording him the opportunity to initiate his business, to test the validity of our analysis, and to observe Mr. Russell's operation and business practices. Unfortunately, Mr. Russell then immediately faced the ill-fated timing in April of 2020 of attempting to start a business at the onset of the pandemic. Despite the unprecedented challenges and launching of a business as the U.S. economy was completely shut down and then very slow to recover, Mr. Russell persevered. I can state that despite these challenging circumstances, I found Mr. Russell to be diligent, professional, and honorable in complying with all terms and conditions of the original lease. This lease renewal will afford Mr. Russell the opportunity to finally realize his original full business plan. To further orient you to the lease location and renewal terms, please observe the site location map. The lease premises are outlined in blue with the station location at the upper end of the area shaded in red. The building with the white roof at the right side of the aerial photo is the La Quinta Hotel on RTA property by long-term ground lease. PNC Bank's large operations center is immediately to the north but not shown on this aerial. And the residential West Park neighborhood is connected to our transit services over the rail line by the pedestrian overpass. The renewal terms for this lease include the following. A 10-year term to facilitate significant leasehold improvements proposed and funded by the tenant. Those improvements include a two-bay service building and a small customer convenience center combined with an administrative office. Second, upgrades to perimeter fencing, lighting, directional signage, entrance, and landscaping are also proposed. All improvements require the advance approval of RTA, and the preliminary concept plan has been reviewed by the Division of Engineering. Rent increases tied to historic consumer price index adjustments occur annually over the 10-year term. And finally, RTA reserves the right at all times to cancel this lease for any reason. I can report to the board that after two to three years observing the current limited operation, the premises have always been maintained in good order, and we support offering this tenant the opportunity to realize his original business goals. The benefits of this lease renewal to RTA and to our customers include the following. A focused and tangible effort to promote RTA's real estate program goals and objectives. Second, the lease yields an increase in ridership and general activity at the Puritus rail station. As a result of the limited scale of this parking and shuttle operation, many of Mr. Russell's customers use our red line service to access and return from the airport. Third, the lease provides an interesting a unique combination of customer amenities with the addition of auto detailing services and a convenience operation. And finally, the lease reduces costs to maintain underutilized property. Staff requests that the Audit Safety Compliance and Real Estate Committee recommend this lease renewal with two bird shuttle in detail to the Board of Trustees for approval. At this time, I'm ready to respond to your questions and offer uh, Mr. Russell as also available to respond. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions from the committee or the full board? Thank you for the presentation and for your investment in the business and the property. 
Um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but could you indicate on the map where the building is proposed to be? It's not shown on the aerial, um, Trustee Mersman, but if you look at your packet, there's an exhibit to the uh, lease which offers further detail on a potential building location. It's generally in the... If you see the lease premises as a triangle, it's in the upper point of the triangle. RTA has a uh, trash dumpster at that location, and the reconfiguration of the lease premises would locate Mr. Russell's building in that north corner of that triangular <coughs> lease premises. Sort of below the Puritus Station red, red highlighted area? Correct. I appreciate that it is proximate to the rail station as well, so passengers can access it easily. Yes. Thank you. Is, is that building, it's just going to be a small building for your customers to, trans, you know, to purchase transactions, et cetera, or is it going to have... I'll let Mr. Russell yeah. add some detail, but I, I envision it's similar to a, a drive-through operation for an oil change okay. uh, type business with two service bays, an administrative office, and Got a it. small convenience store. Okay. Uh, just a quick um, hello, Mr. Russell. Been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Burson. Good Terry, morning. Terry. Yeah, I added it since I saw you last time. Um, I just wanted to, to mention and just give you an opportunity to just address the board and nothing major uh, by way of conversation, but just a hello. It's nice to see you in person. We have a lot of um, contracts that come before the board and we don't always get to see the uh, business owners in person. So I think it speaks to your commitment. Um, just as information for the board, I did meet with Mr. Russell um, a few years ago now when this was just a concept. And he did approach our team via Jim with a, an idea and a dream of being able to see this to fruition. And I think you are to be committed for persevering through the COVID pandemic, which we did not see at that time. Um, but you've been doing a great job of being a very responsible tenant. So it definitely would be my endorsement to the board to consider uh, along with your, your information that you have in front of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other Comments or questions? Is there a just can we, for those of us who weren't around when the original was signed, can we just go over the financial terms of the of the lease? If you would be able to, uh, I'm sorry to say that again. Yeah. Uh, there are a, a good number of us who weren't around when the original contract was signed. So could we just go briefly over the financial terms of the lease? The original lease was a two-year lease with a, a one-year option to extend. Uh, the rent figure was $1,000 per month with CPI adjustments. The new lease will be a 10-year program allowing Mr. Russell to finance significant leasehold improvements. Each year, the, the rent will increase from its existing level through uh, CPI adjustments to a, a peak of about $15,500 per year. Thanks. Thank you. Jim, if you could, um, very briefly, if there are any additional comments about what was happening with the land before we entertain the uh, proposal by Mr. Russell to kind of show the, the, the benefit, I think, of engaging in something like this. Um, we always talk about TOD, and we also talk about being able to take advantage of odd pieces uh, of land that we may have in our coffers. And I think this is a good example of being able to capitalize on those pieces of land that typically don't have any other purpose but to house vehicles. This is actually um, taken in a, a slightly different direction. Uh, thank you. When the, when the station was initially designed, you can see the, uh, the concept was to offer a, a large number of parking spaces to access the rail station. Over time, as service adjustments were made, customers uh, readapted. The area that we leased to Mr. Russell was uh, primarily vacant. Um, as you can see in this aerial photo right now, <laughs> Mr. Russell's customers are using the property, and our general parking area at this particular moment is, is lightly used. 
Uh, we hope to create with new activity and new vitality at the station some, some additional use of all properties. We have a number of properties in our system that are underutilized. Um, and I think uh, the general approach with TOD is to try to reactivate those for economic uses, for customer convenience, and to allow RTA to adapt its system to changing uh, customer preferences. Thank you for the uh, overview um, today, and uh, glad to hear your, your business is, is thriving. I guess I'm also curious on the activation front, is there a stated strategy or goal relative to DBE businesses and really ensuring that per, as RTA is thinking about that activation that there's a priority placed on, on DBE? I would defer to uh, Ms. Birdsong, Terry. <laughs> So I appreciate this, um, scanning the room, because we didn't have everybody in the dry run that's in here today. But that came up as a matter of presentation. Um, I know that we have some folks online as well. But um, funny as it, as it is for timing, we're actually going to be um, hosting a couple of forums for DBE participation coming up, one with NAMAC, which is uh, a historical um, support organization administrative-wise for uh, MBEs, DBEs and others within the community, we also are, are, are starting to really re-energize our, our conversation about utilization of DBEs. We utilize that term DBE, but MBE is, is, is fastly taking over that, um, along with the CUBE Symposium for Greater Cleveland Partnership. Um, so those are just examples, um, trustee love, of being able to really get out there and be active. Um, as we were actually figuring out how to present this information to you today, the question of DBE came up. I personally always believe that there are many um, values that fall under DBE. If we're talking about minority-owned businesses, if we're talking about diversity of, of actual expertise, uh, female-owned or ability, I think they're all encompassed in it. Um, for this particular uh, project, I always think that diversity of project comes above everything else. And in that respect, um, it is a, a twofold. I think that it is a minority-owned business uh, by a young entrepreneur. But to say that we have checked the box for DBE in this one probably wouldn't be quite as accurate. But it does provide a great stepping stone for us to look at our business owner profile and who we do business with, giving back to the customer as well as the community. So I think to answer your question, it checks the box. Um, but it was an unintentional check, if I can say that. Yep. Mr. Russell asked if he could add one comment. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to first thank every, the RTA support over the last four years uh, of this venture. Um, like Mr. Rusnov mentioned previously, we started this at a very difficult time. Um, and I think uh, a major portion of our business has come from the, the business that we had uh, previous from starting here. And uh, it allows us to sustain ourselves through, you know, the last four years. But we were doing business in the city of Cleveland for six years prior to this. So just want to thank everybody for the support. Uh, moving forward, the, the business venture with the detail shop will be a main niche of commercial vehicles, large vehicles that um, are not able to be cleaned and maintained through normal car washes. Um, this will be um, developed with that concept. Uh, so like I said, um, moving forward, I just think that this will be sustained through uh, a unique niche of commercial vehicles and, and larger vehicles. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Good luck. Is there a motion to refer this to the full board? Second, Welch. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, I believe that's the only item we have under the agenda, unless any committee member has any new business. OK, if not, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion, Welch. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Yep. 
like to call to order the Committee of the Whole Board. Uh, Teresa, if you could please call roll. Mayor Kumar. Here. Ms. Welch. Here. Mayor Biasiata. Here. Mr. Love. Here. Reverend Lucas. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm answering the roll. I didn't forget to take off my hat. This was a gift from the event, so I wanted everybody to see it. Present. <laughs> Ms. McPherson. Ms. Mersman. Here. Ms. Pachetti. Here. Mr. Sleesman. Here. And Mayor Weiss. Here. We have nine committee members present. You have a quorum. Great. The first item on the agenda today is a code book update uh, requesting amendment to Chapter 2, 464, Protection Against Internal Losses of Public Assets, and Section 460.06, Insurance Fund. And uh, we have Don Tarka, Associate Counsel, as we've had in the past, uh, presenting the proposed uh, changes to the code. Good morning. Good morning. Mayor Kumar, members of the board. I'll skip my introduction. <laughs> I think most of everybody here knows me. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss a couple provisions for the, from the board's policies and procedures, commonly known as the code book. These policies were codified in 1989, and we're undertaking a review to update the policies and bring them in line with current operations. They're subject to review and revision every three years. Our first section is 46006. This relates to the insurance fund. The insurance fund is a fund where the authority accumulates resources to protect against a catastrophic loss or an extraordinary loss. It is not used to pay out day-to-day -day claims. The provisions that we're recommending be changed include the uh, correcting the title of the director of risk management. And then there's one point, if the insurance fund is used to pay a catastrophic loss, there needs to be a mechanism to replenish the funds. And we are proposing in section 46006E that instead of the board preparing that schedule, it would be the secretary treasurer as a, as a member of the board's, uh, as an officer of the board. And you can see the exact language in the red line that's included in your board package. The second provision that we'd like to discuss is Chapter 464 that has a long, complicated title called Protection Against Internal Losses of Public Assets. What that really means is it provides the authority the ability and opportunity to use mechanisms such as crime insurance, directors and officers liability insurance, bonding, to protect the authority's assets from either acts by employees whose job responsibilities give them access to financial resources or to protect the authority against fraud. In this provision, we are proposing to correct the title of the general manager. The language in this document goes back to a time in RTA's history where the general manager and the secretary treasurer were one and the same person. And since that's no longer the case, we're just correcting the language so that general manager refers to the general manager. There's some editing to clarify language in a couple places. And then finally, to again, clarify the distinction between the general manager and the secretary treasurer, the language in this provision in subsection F is being proposed to be changed so that it clearly states that it is the secretary treasurer who gives a bond that's pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code and the authority's bylaws. Staff recommends that the Committee of the Whole recommend these provisions to the full board for approval. Are there any questions? Yeah, why don't we just take the insurance fund, the first item um, first, and handle that, and then we'll move to the second. Um, any questions or comments from the members? Yes, Mayor Weiss. Appreciate the explanation on, on this one, since I frankly wasn't uh, familiar with the insurance fund. I know that's not exactly you know, your responsibility here today, but I thought I would just ask. So just so I make sure I understand, the insurance fund is used, I assume, for it, it references self-insurance, or I'm assuming it's um, um, liability where we have perhaps umbrella or excess coverage above, and this is the the agency's portion of that, that exposure? Is that a fair? 
Mayor Weiss, I can, I can uh, certainly try answering that question. You're absolutely correct. Uh, and as Don pointed out, the regular claims and accidents are not settled through this fund. This is only intended for catastrophic events, and thankfully we have not experienced uh, any. Uh, in simple terms, and that's the way I, have, uh, I understand it, so if I can share that information, the board policy is to maintain a minimum of $5 million in this reserve fund. Uh, and, and, and this is a part of the reserve fund that we often talk about that is made up of sub funds, as insurance obviously is one of them. It has more than five million currently, um, and we don't expect it to go down, or we hope not for it to go down. Um, so that's, that's basically what the entire thing is. Great, thank you for the explanation. Other questions? Yes, Ms. Mercer. As I interpret the, the change in E, it seems like we're moving from a recommendation from the Secretary Treasurer and Board approval to um, Secretary Treasurer just kind of deciding what to do and being able to move forward with that. Is that correct? Yes. And was there some thought that Board approval would be not timely enough to react, or what's the thought around removing that? The, the process is more... Uh, within the parameters of the Secretary Treasurer. In other words, the Secretary Treasurer also serves as the DGM of Finance for the organization. So that's the person who's really in a position to look at the budget, look at the resources, and decide what's a reasonable way to replenish the fund. Thank you. It makes sense to me that the Secretary Treasurer, DGM of Finance, would kind of direct that and make the recommendation. Since we are talking about very large sums of money, I'm not sure that it makes sense to remove the board approval, but would be interested in how that um, pairs with our other policies around dollar amounts and approvals. Yeah, and I think, um, and when I went over this with uh, the secretary, um, treasurer, and, and Ms. Tarka, um, I didn't have this in front of me. I was, when we were on a Zoom call, we talked about it. And I think that, quite honestly, was my question is, does it need board approval, or at the very least, communicate what that level is to the board. Um, I think that communication is probably the same as, as approval. But um, you know, I think just that in this day and age with what's happening in, with insured assets, um, just to have that in there, that there is some communication, um, I would be fine with either end. But I'll defer to the board on that. And Mr. Mayor, if I, if I may, uh, the issue over here is replenishment of our own funds rather right. than new expenditures. So the expenditures you would certainly hear about in the event of a catastrophic loss, because that would be widely known, uh, we would pay that thing out. The, the provision over here is the replenishment of the fund to be back in compliance with the board policy of maintaining a minimum amount. I, I would... I have no problem with this. I have no problem with not having to approve the schedule. Um, the change, I think, moving something from board approval to really anywhere else, I think should carry a sentence in there saying the board will be the board will be advised of what the new schedule is, you know, reasonably shortly thereafter. That's just kind of a transparency, good governance. If it's no longer going to come to us for approval, I at least want to make sure that when that decision is made, we're we're notified shortly thereafter. Mr. Sleesman, one more comment. Um, our board policies require that any transfer of funds uh, between funds does require board policy. So if we are moving any funds from the general fund into the insurance fund, we will come back to you to seek approval. OK. Yeah. Quick, if, if I may, um, <laughs> it, it, I think we're saying the same thing from two different ends of the, the, the policy. Um, what might make sense is for uh, our secretary treasurer to confer with our legal counsel to add, um, if it makes sense, a one-liner within the red line version to uh, ensure that it's done in, with concurrence of the board. And that could be by way of conversation, notification to the chair, right, uh, by way of secretary treasurer so that we don't bog down the process, but we also make sure that the notification is there. I think what I hear... Raj saying is the notification happens preemptively. This is a kind of shoring up of the accounts, but we want to make sure that we're not perceived as doing anything under cloak and dagger. So we can definitely adjust that to ensure that that transparency notification is made without actual resolution. 
Right. Yeah, I think it's just a transparency piece. I don't think there's any doubt that you're probably in the best position to yeah. determine that in your role. Um, uh, but just that notification for transparency, if you can work through that, that would be great. Great. So if since we are in the committee, I'm also going to be looking at our general counsel through Janet to make sure I'm within the right guideline that we have the time to be able to amend this via Don and legal counsel in concurrence with Raj, be able to present this uh, back to the board in time for uh, adoption, hopefully at our board meeting later on in the month. So we can adjust the, the red line as needed in order to bring it forward. I'm not sure I, how I that works. I think the motion could just say, you know, to incorporate the discussion, um, amending it based on those things, and that would be coming to the board for review and approval at the next meeting. That's fine. If the, if the goal is to make sure that this concludes language, that there will be notification to the board of the schedule for replenishment, then we can add that. If that's what the board wants us to do, we can certainly do that. The goal, of course, would be to be able to bring this back to you at the next meeting for approval. Yes. But if, if, if I'm, I see if the nodding heads are confirming that that's what you want to see, we can make sure that that line gets added. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so why don't we do that one first because we know I have an amendment. Um, is there a motion to move that to the full board to incorporate our discussion as amended and let the administration take care of that? So move, Mayor Weiss. Second. Second, Marsman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. We'll move that to the full board. Let's move on to the second item. Are there questions on protection against internal losses of public assets? Comments from board members. And I had one question I was asking um, Secretary Treasurer this before. I've seen this in a couple of things, and just from a, a protocol on the first page, 46402 policy provisions um, it, to comply with the requirements of Ohio law or to apply with Ohio law. And in, in that, are we saying the Ohio revised code when we say Ohio law? The term Ohio law is a little bit broader than the Ohio Revised Code, okay. primarily the statutory scheme, yes. Okay. But Ohio law also includes uh, case law, regulations, and so we're looking at all of Ohio law instead of specifically just the Revised Code. Okay, great. And then item F under 46402. Again, I apologize, I didn't have it in front of me when we talked, but again, we, we talked prior to the meeting. Um, I, I know we had a very good um, discussion on this of breaking this out to the secretary treasurer and the other insurance that is currently covered by other officers. And could we just <coughs> maybe elaborate on the discussion we had on the phone on that? Sure. Either one of you? Historically, the general manager and secretary treasurer were one and the same person here at RTA. And uh, when Ms. Birdsong joined us, the board had determined to split those two Part, those two positions apart and have those two positions held by different people. So that left an ambiguity in our code because our code says the general manager, secretary, treasurer shall provide a bond. And uh, at, when we looked at that, when we did our review, we said that's confusing both to us and the public. So we went back and we looked at the Ohio Revised Code. The Ohio Revised Code provides that the secretary treasurer must provide a bond, but it says nothing about the general manager. In keeping with the provision in the Ohio Revised Code, RTA's bylaws also provide that the Secretary Treasurer must provide a $100,000 bond. So in order not to have this provision conflict with the bylaws, we are proposing language that references the statutory requirement and the bylaws that simply says the Secretary Treasurer will give the bond that is required by the bylaws and the Revised Code. And by putting it in this format if the revised code should change for some reason then this language automatically flows with that and would not have to be amended at a later date that is correct but the bylaws would be amended okay. um, and then down in 46403 um, I just had um, a question there again given the environment that we are in um, one thing we did not talk about on the phone um, was, I don't believe so, was uh, yearly to every, at least every three years. And I was just curious of your thoughts on, on that change in the frequency.
I frankly wish that our director of risk management were here. I yeah, I was looking for her in the audience, so I didn't want to put you on the she spot. She respond that, to that a little bit more clearly. I was trying to understand what the process was and if it was an arduous process and if it aligned with our insurance. Um, and so I don't know if you have a comment on that. I would, I'm not sure. So Janet, I know you're conferring with Raj. In absence of Judy, I don't know if you have additional comments. It's for the first sentence in the 464 Dot oh three periodic review it changes from an annual review to a three year triennial. If you've got commentary, if you have any intel regarding the impact for the insurance, so or Raj, I, I can offer some speculation on my part, and I wish uh, Judy Lincoln had been available, who I would would have been able to confirm uh, what what I'm about to speculate. <laughs> um, the valuation and the determination of the amount of the policies that we need to carry is a detailed and involved process looking at the replacement value of all of authorities' assets. So that is a deeper dive. So an annual creates additional burden uh, on, the, on, the, on the work, which is why I think, and once again, this is just speculation on my part, and you can, you can chime in, Janet, uh, that at least every three years, that, that means that it can be done sooner if situation warrant, uh, situations warrant them. Um, the idea is to continue doing it on an annual basis, but not to impo impose overly restrictive items on us. And, and uh, as, a, as a last thought, when Judy Lincoln is back in the office, we will certainly confirm with her and convey if that is the rationale or if there is any other reason. Janet, did you have anything that you wanted to add? The other thing I would, would add is that you, you Board will recall that whenever we come back to you about um, renewal of our insurance coverage, we go over this kind of information. And as Raj indicated, you know, we take a look at our assets uh, and and what needs to be, you know, increased. We take a look at the market and all these kinds of things. And so what we're talking about here is at least every three years. Um, but I I gather that what the board may want to see this every year. Is that what I'm? I'm not sure. I, I was just asking the reasoning behind it, okay. whether that was an arduous process. And I know in talking with um, the CEO, you know, we were discussing we could definitely have um, Ms. Lincoln here um, at right. the next meeting when we're voting on it. And then I think, did you have a, a slight tweak potentially? Yes. Um, so I think the, the idea is to have Judy, of course, be available if she's available by uh, the next meeting. But we can always add in, and, and Raj, you said it best, keep it at the triennial is, unless there's some red flag that we're not aware of. But um, add a, uh, a couple words that indicate that we can look at it uh, on a, don't wait the three years if, if something happens that, that arises, right? That we need to look at it before that three year comes to fruition. So if we have an extenuating circumstances that might allow us to look at it on an annual basis because of a triggering event, then we have the ability to do so. But I think we would sustain the three-year recommendation and then have Judy be able to explain that before the vote. Yeah, that'd be fine. OK. okay. We can do that. And then last but not least, I would, again, and this may be a, a, a question for her as well. Um, again, apologize for not bringing up prior. Um, under 46403, right below that, um, um, the amendment shall be made in accordance with the bylaws of the Greater Cleveland Transit Authority. And again, I'm more out of curiosity why that, that line was removed, what the rationale was for that. It's to clarify First. the language a little bit. Um, this was written to provide for the review of the internal loss protection, but the reference to the amendment um, amendment is a term that typically refers to amending the code. Gotcha. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about making a recommendation about what the internal loss protection should be. So the reference to the amendment really doesn't fit with the rest of the section. Great. Thank you for that. Any other questions from board members? Is there a motion to move it forward incorporating um, the um, the edits proposed by CEO Terry and then having that up for board approval in the next meeting um, with a caveat that we'll try and have Judy Lincoln here to present just to round out that discussion on insurance. I know there's so much going out there in the world today. It's, I think that's why we're paying a little closer attention to it.
Is there so a motion? moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I remember if that's your last name. Yeah, I don't think we have anything else, anything other under the Committee of the Whole that new business. Okay, is it? One more agenda item. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Title Seven. Nope. Was was looking at uh, committee agenda there. Okay, we do have one more title, uh, a presentation, Title Seven program uh, from Felicia Brooks William uh, regarding an update on that and affirmative action goals, um, 2024 through 27. Welcome. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Felicia Brooks Williams. Good morning. Excuse me. Let me step back for a minute. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. President, CEO Terry, and members of the board. My name is Felicia Brooks Williams. I am the Senior Manager of the Office of Equal Opportunity, ADA, and DEI programs. I'm here to present on the Affirmative Action Goals and our EEO plan. I am also joined by the managers of the Talent Acquisition Department, um, Ida Ford, and Al Roy Gibson, who will be addressing recruit, our recruitment efforts and challenges. We also have DCI consultant that, consultants that are on the line who help prepare our affirmative action plan and goals. With the approval of the Committee of the Whole, a resolution will be presented to the Board of Trustees for that April 16th meeting. The presentation will consist of the legal foundation of the Title VII, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. What does the requirements mean to RTA, GCRTA? Why is this important to GCRTA? How are the goals formulated? Our progress as it relates to 20, 2023? Our recruitment efforts and challenges? our proposed goals um, for 2024 and 2027, what does the goals require, and our initiatives and accomplishments. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is the legal foundation for Title VII. It is the federal employment law that prohibits employment discrimination based on protected class, such as race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. And what does this mean to GCRTA? It means as a federal grant recipient, it is we are not to discriminate against anyone of a protected class as stated in the law. GCRTA must comply with equal opportunity employment laws and develop an EEO plan and set affirmative action goals. We perform this exercise to determine if there are any areas of underutilization in the authority's workforce, specifically in the female or minority populations. And considering the female population, all races and national origins are included. If underutilization exists, we set corresponding goals to remedy that underutilization. Setting goals is a mandatory element of our affirmative action program. And to ensure compliance, we are required to prepare a plan and submit it to FTA every four years. Our plan is due on May 1st of 2024. The plan is a written plan and has seven components. It consists of a statement a statement policy, which is an affirmative action plan to ensure that RTA is committed to the EEO program. A dissemination plan that also defines or explains how RTA communicate that information internally to their employees as well as externally. It, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Designation of personnel responsibility. It means that do we have somebody that's responsible to manage the EDEO program, and that is the Office of Equal Opportunity. We must conduct a utilization analysis, 
And if there is any underutilization, we must set goals and timetables. We also must assess our employment practices where we look at our, our policies and procedures and how do we monitor and report um, as it relates to EEO. What does this mean to RTA? It means as a federal grant recipient, we are not to discriminate. Oh, did I go back? I'm sorry. Why is this important? It's important to strive to attract, develop, motivate, and retain a diverse workforce. But it's also a good business practice to have a diverse workforce that reflects the population that we serve. And failure to comply may result in the suspension or termination of federal financial assistance. It also helps the, the hiring managers and the talent acquisition department to target and recruit females and or minorities for underutilized job categories. How are the goals formulated? There's a three-step process in regards to formulating the goals. First, we take a snapshot of our workforce by EEO job categories, and then we compare that snapshot with the availability of the relevant labor market to identify underutilization. If there is underutilization, an affirmative action goals are affirmative action goals are established. Now you see our workforce as of December 31st of 2023. The authority workforce force consisted of 66% males and 34% females. Specific, specifically males, black males comprised of 37%, white males 27%, Hispanic males 2%, Asian, American Indian, and two or more races, less than 1%. Of females, approximately 27% are black females, 5% white females, Hispanic American Indian females, as well as Asian females, two or more races are less than 1%. The EEO job categories is defined by the federal government. It's officials and administrators, which are your executive level positions, professionals, which are managers, associate counsels, technician, system positions, protective services, which, are, which is our transit police area, administrative support, secretarial positions, skilled craft are your maintenance or met your mechanical positions, mechanics, and service maintenance, operators, laborers, hostlers. We also consider the demographics of the relevant geographic labor market. One such labor market is that of Cuyahoga County and the surrounding counties. Currently, approximately 81% of GCRTA employees reside in Cuyahoga County. The relevant geographic labor market is defined as the area from which GCRTA usually seeks or reasonably could seek workers to fill the positions in question. The exception is an executive level position where we would seek applicants from throughout the United States. What do the goals require? The goals require for RTA to put forth a good faith effort to achieve goals that it has set through recruitment and outreach. It does not require any specific position be filled by a person of a particular race or gender. The goals are not quotas. It still requires the best qualified person to receive the job. Our affirmative action goals for 2023 progress report we set goals because of underutilization of some of the EEL job categories. And in total, we set goals to hire or promote 500 minorities or females because of underutilization or underrepresentation, I should say, within each job category. We hired and promoted a total of 120 based on the set goals for 2020 to 2023. 
we met our goals in particular areas of officials administrators. We hired two white females, professionals, Asian males and females, protective services, Hispanic female, semi-skilled craft, two or more races, and service, service maintenance, the goal for two or more races also was met. We still have areas to reach parity, as you notice in the last two columns. However, the goals are not quotas, and the most qualified candidate is to be hired. As we move forward to setting new goals, we will continue to put forth a good faith effort in the recruitment and selection of females and minorities in the underutilized areas. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ida Ford and Al Roy Gibson to talk about the recruitment efforts and challenges during the 2020 and 2023 years. Good morning. Thank you, Felicia. Good morning, Board President Kumar, General Manager, and the entire board. I want to talk to you about some of our challenges that we did face in the talent acquisition team. I'll be very brief to give you an overview so you can have some time for questions. Okay. As we talk about our challenges, our number one challenge culturally was the pandemic. Um, it forced our, well, on the good side, it forced our talent acquisition uh, professionals to kind of think outside the box placing equal weight on passive job seekers as we did aggressive job seekers. There certainly was a shortage of drivers um, that was magnified since the pandemic. Uh, we had competition in the marketplace. Uh, other employers had signed on bonuses, having the options to work from home, uh, increased overtime. Uh, we had folks that were working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, and that was in all lines of business, which led to burnout and, and team fatigue of our staff. Um, learning how to work outside of traditional hours, evenings, weekends, recruitment events. And we had a young team, um, a young team that was uh, in need of some staff development to address some of these challenges and issues. But as we transitioned, we talked about some of our efforts, talent acquisition and the operations teams collaborated. We decided together to develop a people strategy where it became everyone's responsibility to hire and retain staff to improve a customer experience. And we stepped out outside our silos. We're talking about partnering in events together, uh, having hiring manager conversations about expectations, changing maybe some of the uh, standard operating procedures, talking about socialization. How do we incorporate new people that come into our culture and get them involved into what we have to offer? And then talking about progression. How do we take a person that comes in this area and then move them along into a path of success? We're talking about staff investment. We reinvested time and education in our staff. Several of our staff members have now received a SHRM certification. They have uh, participated in frontline leadership, Six Sigma. And then we redeveloped uh, local and regional partnerships with workforce development entities, education, nonprofit, uh, community uh, anchors in the community to attract diverse candidates. Our reach has not just covered uh, Cuyahoga County, but we've actually expanded our reach out in Lorraine, uh, Lake County, Summit, Portage, and as we look at some of our new hires uh, from last year, even Medina, Ashtabula, Giaga, and Knox County. So we're kind of heading in the right direction, and I'm gonna turn it over to Alroy to close out, close out and talk about some efforts and wins. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as Ida shared, some of the um, strategies that we really focused on is being out in the community with us having a, um, the goal of um, attracting underrepresented um, uh, demographics at RTA. We really focused on uh, community events. Uh, those community events consisted of partnering with the Asian uh, Spanish, Amer Spanish American Committee, um, as well as uh, going to Cleveland Public Libraries. Uh, we also collaborated with a lot of other nonprofits. And what we did uh, from the previous slides is not only focused on the Cuyahoga County, but the surrounding, uh, the surrounding counties. Um, one of the things that uh, we did uh, when coming in from 2022 to 2023 was focusing on uh, decreasing our operator deficit. And uh, from our um, engagement events, we did over 80 events last year. Uh, we were able to attract a lot of talent. Uh, we decreased our deficit from 148 to 98, 
Um, we have a, a big event this week. Uh, we're partnering with uh, Tri-C Metro Campus. Uh, we're expecting a couple hundred uh, candidates to come to that event. Our goal is to get uh, 50 solid candidates to reduce it from 98 to under 50. So we are really uh, strategizing to attract talent, but also focus on the critical positions to fill. Um, we shared uh, on the previous slide some of the demographics with just attracting the minority talent. Uh, last week we were at Matrix uh, Auto Trade School. Um, we are looking to partner with them to attract and have young talent be able to come to our uh, central bus facility and be able to see what it's like to uh, uh, work as a, a mechanic at RTA, you have an opportunity to speak with our employees, interact with them, and really get an overview of what a career looks like and not a job. Uh, some of the other things that uh, we touched on is just the decrease in overtime. When you look at uh, where we were last year with uh, 148 operators, we did have a challenge because as we shared, uh, burnout, um, and then not to mention when operators are burnt out and they're working 50 to 70 hours a week, uh, that causes call offs uh, by us really pushing to decrease the uh, deficit for operators as well as our mechanic initiative and transit police. Uh, we have significantly uh, reduced our overtime from last year. So we will continue to strive and push in that direction. Uh, additionally, we also had some initiatives to attract talent. Uh, we focused on uh, wage progression increases. Uh, we increased our wage for uh, operators that finish our training from $21 to nearly $26. Additionally, we uh, initiated and implemented a referral program for our skilled trade positions, such as uh, mechanics and other uh, skilled uh, uh, trade positions, as well as for our, um, our operator position. Um, as a result of last year from our efforts, we hired a total of 463 new hires. Uh, one of the things that we will continue to focus on is our community engagement events. We've done over 20 um, year to date for the first quarter, and we've hired over 123 uh, new hires in the first quarter. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I apologize, any questions? Questions from the board? Yes. Just a quick comment, I'll be very brief. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the team, but also note for the board, um, you might have noticed that a lot of the, the checkpoints that Felicia, Ida, and Alroy have mentioned are exceeded in the work that they presented in front of you today. That is uh, not by happenstance, that's very intentional. Um, as Felicia mentioned, I do serve as the authority's uh, chief civil rights officer, and I think that that's a, a personal uh, passion for me to make sure that we work above and beyond the national standards of what's required for transportation companies. Um, I will say that I had several conversations with other CEOs in different organizations for transit throughout the, the country, and they were very surprised to hear that not only did I serve in that role, but our team uh, did more than what was required. Um, so even being able to meet, those standards are so low within the federal regulation that you only have to meet twice a year. We meet four times at minimum. Those kind of investments in our community and investments in our transit um, industry, I think are imperative in order to reach some of the things that Ida and Alroy mentioned specifically to retaining employees and also knocking down that operational deficit. We've taken that seriously. We have a lot more work to do, but not being able to find the candidate is absolutely inexcusable for an industry where we know that we live in a city that has in employment issues, right? We've got to make sure that we reach the people that can work for us and they're out there, and we have to be creative about going into the communities that may or may not know about public transit. Um, and that's what we've continued to do. So I appreciate what you've done, but I want to make sure that that was not lost on the committee as well as, as you look at what's, what the work has uh, consisted of. Yeah, it was great to see that oh. where you're pulling employees from regionally that just not from sort of close to our headquarters, but, you know, your reach is expanding. That's great. To add to our accomplishments, um, GCRTA received recognition for best in class for nonprofit government from the Greater Cleveland Partnership Act for 
workforce diversity, just recently as 2023, and previously for senior management diversity. As a result of winning three or more awards, we were inducted into the Hall of Fame for best in class for workforce and senior management diversity. And in an effort to enhance our diversity and create inclusion and belonging, we have established four employee resource groups, Elevating Women Together, Latinos Uninos, Pride, and Veterans. We have also incorporated a DEI Plus learning series to empower, educate, and engage our employees. The proposed goals for your consideration consist of a total of 307 placement goals based on, based on the utilization analysis. These goals were prepared by DCI consultant and recommended for GCRTA to put forth an effort to address underrepresented, underrepresentation among minorities and females in each job category. If the Committee of the Whole concurs with these proposed goals, we would like to request that the committee recommend these goals be approved at the full board meeting on April 16th. Questions? All right, you've heard the presentation. I don't think there are any more questions this time. Would there be a motion to move that to the full board? Could I, could I, could we go back a couple slides real quick? Sure. Thanks. Sorry, I just want to get another look at this. You will be presented with a draft uh, with a copy of the plan and the goals, the proposed goals prior to the April 16th meeting. Is the consultant online right yes, now? Yes, DCI okay. consultant is online to address any questions in regards to how um, these goals were formulated. Is DCI local? Is this a local organization or? No, they're not local. Location? Washington, D.C. Thank you. Is D.C. on the line? Do they want to say, ask them to? They are on the line. If you want them to speak, they just have to unmute. Trustee Sleesman, did, did you have a question? Uh, I did. Not necessarily. I wanted to get a closer look at this and see where some of these numbers were, not where they came from necessarily. I, I have no reason not to believe that this wasn't done well. It was more what we were, what we were, uh, where we would have to reach highest and farthest in order to meet these goals. So mm -hmm. thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and we're gonna get a copy of these, correct? Yes, you'll okay. get a copy, you prepare them today or you get a copy before the April 16th meeting. I, I'll just state the question that I think we're getting to. Would, I, I would like to understand um, more about how the uh, this group came to these recommendations, just to understand like how they fit within the local context and what we should be striving toward and why. If, if I can ask, um, if we've got the consultant on the line, DCI, if, if you'd be able to unmute yourself and acknowledge that you're here. Hi there, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you so much. Um, not sure if you've, I think you've been able to follow through the conversation. If you'd be able to, uh, this is India Birdsong Terry, nice to virtually see you again. Uh, if you'd be able to address some of the questions that we have from the board, we've got the slide up for the proposed uh, affirmative action goals for 2024 to 27. If you can be able to speak to the creation of those goals and perhaps the market standard for our agency and how we've uh, arrived at these figures, that would be great. Right, right, absolutely. So I love that the team highlighted their initiatives. Um, in terms of where we come to these goals, this really goes back to how the RTA establishes their compliance with the FTA. Um, so what Felicia beautifully described is how um, the requirement is to create an EEO program. And that's where you kind of describe your efforts, what you have in place to um, improve your equal employment opportunity at your organization, but also identify areas of improvement, right? So this is where the affirmative action goals come into place. 
Um, DCI utilizes FCA's requirements and um, tools to establish goals. And how we do that is we look at your workforce, what's the incumbency that you currently have, and compare that to um, what data would suggest is the diversity that you should have in place in your recruitment area. So that was where we looked at those counties. So we compare what's the representation in those counties and also what's the representation in your organization. And through FDA schools, we establish these goals. Um, and what I think was beautifully highlighted is that affirmative action goals should not be a uh, preference or preferential, sorry, justification for preference. <laughs> Um, rather, it should be used as a sort of goal post or a, a light post for where your outreach and recruitment efforts should be focused. Um, so what DCI's um, approach and standard is, is to recommend that, that you shouldn't view goals as something to be reached, but should be aspirational and should be areas of focus for your outreach and recruitment. So I hope that was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions or if anything was missed. I'm curious about the challenges with young, young individuals. Um, just when we see them leaving, um, and obviously my background is um, working with youth in education and trying to create pipelines of succession. And so it's concerning to see um, a lot of young individuals leaving. And so I'm just wondering um, what are kind of the action items that have we've been putting in place to try and retain them? Um, what does that look like? Um, beyond Tri-C, have we had any outreach efforts around representation within our district to ensure that they can see a career path with um, the agency? Um, that's my question. Thank that, you. That is an awesome question, and I can get started, and, and we can kind of talk about with the mentoring ship program uh, that uh, the, the the bus drivers you know, the bus operators have, I think has been very instrumental. Uh, we find that most of the, the turnover with the operators, it's, it's a very difficult job. So they resign, uh, go AWOL, um, you know, or just, it's just attendance issues. Uh, so we are talking about some soft skills um, that we would like to incorporate into the, the, the uh, training program. In addition to coaching and development, a talent acquisition goes out. And so when I talked about a person starts at point A to point B, if you've been here for a long time, your resume may not reflect all of the skills that you have. So we have one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations uh, with some of the talent to make sure that they stay. We talked about the socialization with the employer resource groups to integrate people, um, you know, just so they can feel that like they belong. Even something as, as simple as helping people with their application, the resume development. We, we did some workshops with resume development. We're having some interviewing skills and techniques. And in addition to, um, so I just forgot my thought here. It was a good one, too. But <laughs> we do a lot of so good The PIP things. program, because I think that's part of it also, right? That's the mentoring. The, that's for, that's yeah, the mentoring. So, okay. PIP, yeah, the PIP. The PIP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So just to name a few, those are the things. And even when the first day that people start here in orientation, our team comes down to greet them. You know, that makes a, makes a big difference, to come down to greet them and let them know that I was the one that recruited you, I'm gonna stay by you the entire time. Um, we have the referral bonus program that we talked about, and, it's, and it's, it's actually set up for retention to keep a bus driver or a skilled craft person on, not just to pay the money for referring, but also pay them additional money so when that person falls short and feels down that I'm going to coach you on because together we're going to make it and, and of course I'm going to make a few dollars yeah. in six months or also in a year. So those are some of the things we're doing intentionally, but the soft skills is definitely something that we have to take a deeper dive in. That's great to hear. Are you seeing some um, differences in young individuals applying for maybe professional uh, positions versus maybe the craft and maintenance. I'm curious about those numbers as well. I mean, we talk a lot about race in here, but I mean, it would be great to see numbers around even age and generations and whether we're multi-generation or what that looks like. Thank you. Uh, so to piggyback on what Ida shared, some of the things that we are going to start doing is we really want to obtain some of uh, uh, action items, so we're gonna implement onboarding surveys 
uh, for employees that start after their 30, 60, 90 days following up with them, uh, specifically that younger generation to under make sure they're getting the value that they want because we know it's not all monetary. Um, we're partnering with uh, John Carroll. Um, they're working with us, so we have a cohort that is um, Gen Z, and they're focusing on us uh, providing them information and them taking that information, looking at it and, and giving us feedback on what attracts that younger audience and what keeps them. Uh, so they're looking at everything from our social media, our, our job posting, our, our job descriptions. And from that information, they're, they're um, creating tools and resources and giving us uh, suggestions for improvement. Uh, for instance, um, Ida shared career path one of the things that uh, the students mentioned to us is, as a, a young adult, I want to see a visual, not you just telling me a visual of the different possibilities that I can't go. Mm -hmm. Someone coming into RTA, they won't know the different job categories, yeah. the classifications, yeah. with yeah. something that is tangible that they can see as a resource that they can receive an orientation, or they can receive their first day, they will see, okay, I do not, don't have to go this way. I have three options I can go. Yeah. Not only that, uh, we are working with our marketing team. They are working with a vendor to create a date and life video. So that video is an updated enhancement of what we previously had maybe 10 years ago. Uh, what that video will show is the, the different skill positions, but not only skill positions, but our non-bargain positions of what it is like to work at RTA. Um, what, what value can I get? Uh, when you look at an operator, operator comes in and they take advantage of the tuition reimbursement. Uh, they take advantage of the uh, training, the green belt training, Ohio Lean Six Sigma training, and from those opportunities and having chances to fill in, they get interviewed or, uh, as Ida shared, with our positive impact program, having a mentor. So everything that you're stating, we are taking actionable steps to attract that uh, younger uh, audience and, and also retain them. It's great to hear. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Great. Mr. Vice President Welsh, I wanted to add a couple of things. George Fields, Deputy General Manager for Human Resources. Um, in addition to those outreach efforts, we're also taking a longer view to how people come to transit, uh, mm -hmm. particularly as we talk about the high schools and even as we start in early junior high. Uh, yeah. A number of our, our teams, operations, as well as human resources, uh, collaborate with high schools and, and different programs to make this happen. Um, our director of training employee development, Wendy Talley, she's part of the Friends, Act, Friends of Max Hayes board yeah. uh, that works to attract Max Hayes and Cleveland Municipal School District students to skilled craft, skilled trades, and so we're heavily involved in that effort. Uh, we recently uh, redeveloped and worked, uh, started to work through partnership with the ACE Mentoring Program to, to get re-engaged with, uh, with that population that for skilled, tra skilled craft, trades, engineering, all of those students that they, they, they are primed for looking for these opportunities. They just need to find out where these best opportunities are and get that interest into skilled craft. Dr. Caver and his team are also working uh, the, the high school pipeline as well to be, in front of, uh, to be in front of a student and give them that opportunity to see what the career path looks like at RTA. So that's, that's, that's also part of our longer term uh, recruitment outreach that we know will pay dividends in the future. You all are doing an amazing job. This is fantastic to hear. Thank you so much. On behalf of the team, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you to go to the last slide and make your formal request to the board. <laughs> there we go. The staff requests that the Committee of the Whole recommend the proposed goals to the full board for approval at its April 16th meeting. Thank you for the presentation. Is there such a motion? Second? Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, being that there's no more business, is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Move to adjourn. Motion Welch. <laughs> Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned.